are at the top of the hour. We're excited to have you all here for our webinar, Web Accessibility for Beginners, The Basics for Success. Today is July 20th, and our webinar is brought to you live from Montecito, powered by Civic Club. And just a few quick housekeeping items that we do like to run through um, prior to us diving into the webinar is please feel free to use the live transcription from Zoom. Um, we do have that option available for you. The recording will have closed captioning, um, but we'll send the recording in slides after the session. You do, um, if you could just give us a little bit of time, we do like to add all text and make sure that it's all set up for you guys um, before we send that information. So I'd say just give us about one to two days. And we encourage questions of all kinds, as well as any comments in the chat. We really love um, when everyone's interactive, and I, I certainly like interacting with people within the chat. So put your questions in the Q&A panel, and we will take them at the end of the session, um, as well as feel free to comment in the chat as you see fit. And for the speakers today, I will be your host slash moderator. My name is Ashley Hefner, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Monsito, powered by Civic Plus. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it on over to Jasmine so she can introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine de Guzman. I am the manager of revenue marketing here at Monsito, and I'm super excited to talk to you guys today about the basics of website accessibility and how you really get started as a beginner. And when we're coming up, with the idea for this webinar, my thought was, hey, if I had a new colleague and I was going to teach them everything uh, that I've learned about website accessibility the past two years, what would I teach them? And so that's really what the basis of this webinar will be is if you were joining me, what do you need to know uh, to be successful and get started? So I'll let Ashley uh, kind of take us through the introductions first. Great, thanks so much, Jasmine. And then for our agenda for today, um, just to kind of go over some of the things that we're going to cover for you guys. Number one will be what is web accessibility and why is it important? Number two will be web accessibility examples and how to spot them, as well as the web content accessibility guideline standards and how to comply with them. Web accessibility legislation and the risks of litigation, as well as what you should be prioritizing on your website when it comes to web accessibility. Um, and then as always, we will offer the Q&A. Um, so once again, encourage all questions there and we will save all questions for the end and we'll happily answer them to the best of our ability. And then with that, we do just wanna give a quick disclaimer here that the purpose of this webinar is to provide you guys with accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter, um, but it does not constitute as legal advice. Um, so just wanna let you know that some of the laws discussed today may depend on your jurisdiction type of business and the number of employees. So we might recommend you work directly with legal counsel on any specific legal matters um, that pertain to your business and that may affect your business because um, Monsito is not liable for any errors, omissions, or changes in law. So just a quick little note there. And then with this, um, we do like to do a quick pulse check um, to ask you guys, are you already working with web accessibility? Answer would be yes, we've been tackling it for some time. Yes, but we could be better. We're just getting started, or this is a totally new topic for me. So excited to see where um, everyone's answers come in at. I see that we have over half of the people who have voted. So thank you guys so much for continuing um, to get your votes in. This will be a great question for us to see um, where those of us joining us are with their web accessibility journey, because it certainly is a journey. Absolutely. And I think we've got a few more answers trickling in and then I'll share the results with everyone. All right, I will end the poll now and share the results with you. Perfect. And then with that, it looks like our most popular answer is yes, but we could be better, which is totally understandable. Um, reason why we're one of the reasons why we're having these webinars is to um, you know, kind of take it back to the basics because we know that accessibility is something that is a journey and we all um, could certainly be better at it. Looks like 41% of you are, yes, we've been tackling it for some time. And then the 42% was yes, but we could be better as I mentioned. And then 15% were just getting started and 2%, this is a totally new topic. So hopefully today um, 
you will be able to leave pretty feeling pretty confident about this new topic. Perfect. And then with that, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into what is web accessibility and why it should be a prioritization for your organization. Um, and with this, you know, web accessibility is the practice of making sure that there are no barriers preventing people from accessing your website, such as site visitors using screen readers or an electronic braille display. Um, an example is Stephen Hawking, um, who was able to be, you know, sufficient for himself through some of those various accessibility tools that he utilized. Um, and one thing to note here about the organizational level is that your organization should be prioritizing web accessibility because it's the right thing to do, but it also increases your brand's reputation. It builds trust between your site visitors when, you know, people who do have disabilities are able to, you know, navigate your site successfully. It creates a positive user experience, as well as the WCAG compliance and the SEO factors um, for your website. In addition to that, by having an accessible website, you're able to reach a wider audience. Therefore, it really um, can help your business and it really helps turn visitors into customers, as I mentioned, when that user experience is positive. So with that being said, let's dive, dig a little bit deeper. Perfect. Now with this, we say accessi what? Because I know that <clears throat> Sometimes you hear the word accessibility and like Jasmine mentioned two years ago, I was very similar to her as well. Well, I didn't really know what accessibility was. I knew about physical accessibility, but was new to the idea of digital accessibility and website accessibility. So wanted to give you guys the difference. You may have heard about accessibility, most likely in reference to physical accessibility, examples like ramps and bathroom accessibility, um, but it does go also uh, hand in hand with digital and website accessibility. Because our world has become more digital, there's an increased focus on digital and website accessibility. Digital accessibility is making tools, making digital tools and technologies inclusive for people with disabilities. For example, when you go to a kiosk at an airport and you're able to check in, those items also are digital tools and those need to be accessible for people with disabilities. On the contrary, website accessibility is making sure that your website is inclusive and able to be accessed by people with permanent or temporary disabilities. For example, vision loss, broken arm, um, and some of those other impairments that um, would hinder someone being able to access your website. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and we can move on to the next slide here. Thank you. And with web accessibility um, and disabilities, you know, it does affect more people than you think. I myself was very surprised to find out that one in four adults have a disability um, in our world. So some other statistics to kind of just give you guys to kind of sit with is in the US, it's estimated that 26% of the population lives with a disability. That's 85 million people. That's quite a large number. Internationally, the World Health Organization estimates that 15% of the world's population lives with some type of disability. So when you start to think about those numbers, not having an accessible website, that's a huge market of people that you, know, you could be potentially losing out on if they're not able to access your website. And then having an accessible website really ultimately benefits everyone. Um, it's not just something that benefits those who have dis disabilities. You know, we so often forget about things such as temporary disabilities, which can suddenly change the way we are able to access websites and technologies. Um, a little personal anecdote here is I myself hurt my hand cooking earlier this year. I got a cut and I had to get stitches right here in my hand, which is probably the most inconvenient place to have to get stitches. Um, I was unable to maneuver my hand in the way that I previously have before. Therefore, I was, um, you know, in a position where I had to start utilizing assistive technology. I was doing the talk to text to be able to type in order to communicate with my colleagues. Um, so that is something that is a form of assistive technology where it was unseen and I therefore needed to start utilizing it. Um, and having that experience really helped open my eyes. And in addition to that, um, you can see here, we have a picture of Jasmine um, who is featured on here. And she'll go ahead and share one of her anecdotes because uh, she had a similar experience. Exactly. Thanks, Ash, for giving us that introduction. But yeah, 
Like Ashley mentioned, accessibility is something that really benefits everyone and not necessarily in the ways that you originally imagined. So I earlier this year had um, some eye and vision issues, which means that I had to wear, as you can see on this great image, wear sunglasses inside because I was very sensitive to light and I was not able, I had very low vision. So I had to increase the size. And thankfully I work in this role that I know that there's all this amazing assistive technology out there that could make my life easier so I could continue to work on a daily basis. In fact, I showed this photo to my grandparents who are part of the aging population and they thought it was fantastic that you could enlarge the size of the font on your smartphone. So I actually did that for them. Um, in terms of smart technology as well uh, and search engines, uh, voice assistants and search engines, they are looking uh, at the they, are, they cannot uh, read visually your website. They are looking at other factors. And those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today that it is so much more than just helping those with disabilities. Of course, that is the main, one of the main driving uh, reasons for it is making sure everyone has equal access, but there are benefits beyond. And that's also something that a lot of people are not aware of. So if we jump into it, uh, before I jump into all the heavy stuff and really going into what you need to know, we did just want to do a quick pulse check and I will launch the poll here in a second. Um, let me see if I can do it. There we go. Have any of you had experienced a temporary disability? So yes, you have, no, thankfully not, or no, but you know someone who has. So maybe someone's had a broken arm or maybe you have a family member or a friend who uses different kinds of assistive technology. And feel free to as well put in the chat what types of assistive technology they use, because that's something we're gonna jump into in just a second. So we can see a lot of you have experienced a temporary disability so far, about 53% of you. Yeah, let me share the, the results here real quick. So 52% of you, so you know how important assistive technology is and how it can make a difference. If you haven't, you know what? Maybe one day as you get older, you may need to. So it's great to be informed. And if you know someone who has, again, you probably recognize that this is something that uh, needs to probably be prioritized more in our world today. So how do people um, who do have a disability access a website? Well, one of the first things that I want to teach you is that the way that we access the website with a mouse and keyboard, that's not the only way to access uh, the internet. It's not the only way to access a website and it's not the only way to use a computer. So there are plenty of different other ways other than the typical trackpad or keyboard and mouse. There are screen readers, there is screen magnifica magnification software. That was something that was very uh, useful for me when I had low vision. Electron electronic braille displays are uh, commonly used by people who are blind. Um, sip and puff devices and mouth sticks are um, things for people who have low mobility. Motion and eye tracking devices and head pointers, those would be um, very similar to the example that Ashley pointed out how Stephen Hawking was able to continue to work throughout his life. So just wanted to give you a little bit of an insight because I think we all kind of have this preconceived notion that accessing the internet is done through a computer, but there are so many, and of course it is, but there's so many different ways to do it um, than what you traditionally always know. All right, so why should it be for a priority for your organization? I think we touched on a few of the reasons throughout Ashley's introduction, but it can expand your reach. So um, I think there's a, there's a statistic out there, don't quote me on the exact number, but um, someone who is um, using, for example, a screen reader and tries to access a website, and if they're not able to, they're, you're going to they're going to walk out the door. They're going to find another way to connect either with your business or your organization. They might have to, if you are a local government institution, have to come down there and spend time trying to figure out physical accessibility instead of just uh, being able to access um, important local services online. It, of course, creates a better user experience, not only for uh, people who have disabilities, but also for everyone. A lot of accessibility best practices are also just general user experience best practices. Um, it can help you improve your uh, SEO, your search engine optimization. As I mentioned, um, all of these, uh, the Google algorithms, they're not visually scanning your websites. They are looking at similar things that screen readers look at, for example. 
inclusivity. Inclusivity and digital equality is more important than ever. And if that is not something that is a pro has not yet become a priority for your organization, I'm sure it will at one point or another. And of course, it is the law. We don't want to scare anyone. And we'll touch a little bit more on what that really means a little bit later. But ultimately, the reason that website accessibility should be a priority for your organization is because it's the right thing to do. So let's jump into some common web accessibility issues. And so I really wanted to start off by looking at common web accessibility issues because a lot of the times when you're jumping into this topic, it sounds so terrifying. It sounds so intimidating. You're like, oh, web accessibility. Do I need to sit with a developer? Do I need to learn how to code? How do I tackle it? Yes, there are absolutely some elements of web accessibility that you will need a developer to help with and someone who uh, at least is more tech savvy than I am. But there are also a lot of common web accessibility issues that you as a communicator or a website manager can tackle on your own. Uh, and those are the things I want to highlight to you today, because that's where you can also take the most action immediately and create a long term plan for success, as well as educate other people in your organization. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was color contrast and what do we mean by color contrast and color contrast really refers to when you're matching two colors together, how easily can you see the front layer versus the back layer, I guess is the easiest way to put it. And that can be um, text on a solid background. Here's a couple of different examples of good or low contrast and high contrast. Um, and I never really thought this mattered too much until I had my low vision issue where I really could tell, oh, this color contrast can really make or break how quickly I can absorb that information. And beyond it just being some, for someone who has um, low vision, it's also something that affects people with um, color blindness. So I'll jump into a story in just a second as well about my fiance who is colorblind. And one of the struggles that we often have when he is navigating the web. And I just wanted to make sure, yes, great. Yeah, so one of the uh, uh, challenges that uh, I have, you know what, I'm gonna jump back, tell the story here. One of the challenges that I often have with him is that if you're navigating website and you're trying to, for example, um, highlight that something is wrong on the website or highlight an emergency, you are often using the color red. The problem is if you're using multiple shades of red, it's very difficult to see. So my fiance who has red, green color blindness, he's unable to see that. So I remember one time there was a heat advisory because it was so hot. And I was like, oh, can't you see the heat advisory on the website? Well, he couldn't because they'd use two different shades of red. The color contrast wasn't high enough. It was similar to this uh, blue here in the background, but if you just imagine a red. And so he was unable to read it. So that's also, it shows that important information or critical information can get lost if you're not taking something like a color contrast into an account. So what should you do instead? So here's a couple, and that, that was the second part I wanna to get to. The first thing that you should do is don't assume that you can spot when a color contrast meets requirements. This was one of my first mistakes when I um, started to learn about color contrasts two years ago. Uh, and I was like, oh, I can spot the difference. Um, this color contrast of our logo against a yellow background, that's actually not, it does not technically meet um, the WCG AAA standards, which we'll talk about a little bit later and define what that means, but does not meet those standards. So I think that's the first assumption is make sure you use a color contrast checker if you're not an experienced designer uh, and know that the color contrast is high enough in your design programs. And I think the other thing to make it more scalable for your organization is create a kind of approved color combination um, example. So this is for example, uh, an example from one of our uh, brand style guidelines to show what is approved and whether you are adhering to the level double A or triple A, um, then it's just about checking that. I'm just checking the comments. A lot of people didn't know the colors, but yeah. There's a, it's always great to have one of these guides, just make sure if you have an approved color combination. And we actually have a free color contrast checker on our website um, that you can always use if you're in doubt. All right, moving on to the next example that is, e uh, that is very common and 
easy for you to spot. So one of the first things that you should do if you want to find out if your if your website or even just any website is addressing accessibility is go to website and hit the tab button. And what you see in this uh, GIF here should happen. And if uh, the, right now we are looking at a GIF of the New York Times and someone is hitting the tab button. And what is happening when you hit the tab button is that first of all, this skip to content appears or skip to navigation. This is something that's incredibly useful for screen readers because can you imagine if you're visiting a website like this with a screen reader and you don't have the skip to content, then every single time it would take you through the navigation. So it would say world, US, politics, New York, but being able to skip to content, you can skip directly to the first article here about the Russian pact widens rift between Kerry and Pentagon. So this is one of the, it's a very simple and easy test, but check your website or any website that you're visiting to see if they have that. And this is one of those things that does probably, or does require a developer's help. But from the developers that I've talked to, it is something that's relatively easy uh, to implement and also incredibly um, useful for a lot of people who are using uh, different types of technology to access your website. And I can see one of our team members has shared the color contrast checker uh, in the chat. So if that is something you do want to give a try, that link is available there. Thank you so much, Michael, for helping out with that. Awesome. So the next thing um, that I wanted to share that's very easy for you um, to start addressing right away is alt text. And what do we mean by alt text? A lot of you have probably heard about alt text or alt tags in the context of um, search engine optimization and people saying, oh, put all these uh, put these different phrases on your images in order to improve your search engine optimization. That is one way to improve uh, the accessibility of your website, but it's not necessarily always the right way. An alt text is an alternative text description to the image on your website. So for example, if there is a headshot of the director of your organization, um, the or the alt text should give an accurate and helpful description if a the purple person if a person is using for example a screen reader or if the image doesn't load as well as for search engines so it's serving a, a multitude of purposes but it's also just supposed to give an accurate description so for example if it were to be a headshot of me on a website it could be headshot of Jasmine de Guzman uh, a dark haired uh, younger woman, for example, right? So that is what we mean by alt text. And it is one of the most important things that you should start tackling right away, because not only are we posting images on our websites, but we are also posting it, for example, on social media. And most social media platforms have also made it um, possible for you to add alt text to uh, your images that you're posting there as well today. So if you are prioritizing accessibility, don't only do it on your, your web pages um, and photos on your web pages, but across the board. And the same goes for charts or uh, graphs, those kinds of things, they do need an alternative text. So here's a couple of tips. And I, I put a little challenge in here for you guys, because I know when I was promoting this webinar, I promised to try to make it fun. So I don't have a prize, but I'm going to, I'll give an honorary prize to whoever can give me the best alt text in the chat for this image that I have here on the right, which is a very cute little fluffy thing. Um, but what you should do is you should aim to be short and concise and also find a balance between being informative and over descriptive. Um, you are, uh, adding an alt text in order to give context. Um, and you need to both present the content in the image as well as the function. One of the other things that a lot of, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, Ted. I promise we will, we will give you a little cute descriptions for the alt text coming up soon. Um, but one of the other important things is the function um, of the images. And one of the other things that's important um, to think about is decorative images. And in this case, you can leave the alt text as null or blank um, so that they can kind of skip over that. And for those of you, wow, we are getting lots of great um, alt text suggestions. 
so I will read out a couple of them so that uh, Ted can get a great, and so maybe some of our other uh, listeners can get a great idea, but there is puppy licking his nose, yellow golden retriever licking lips, light colored Labrador puppy. I see we have some uh, discussion now going on between whether it's a Labrador or a golden retriever, uh, but a Labrador puppy licking his nose, a seated golden retriever pupping licking, puppy licking his lips, a hungry puppy, um, so lots of great different uh, descriptions here. Medium-sized puppy looking nose. So you can see here, there's a great variation of uh, different um, ways to describe this as an alt image. <laughs> can there be a new poll for a lab? Future guide dog looking in snows. I have to say that is probably my favorite one. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And I can see there's lots of great uh, questions here as well. So we will, we will jump into it in just a second. And I think someone made a really great point here as well, is that the description of the image depends on the context. Of course, here, there is not as much context. But if this image was shown on a website for um, dogs that could be adopted, then the description could be different. Or someone's giving a, an example for a vet technician class. Right. So it also depends on the context uh, and the function of the image. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for a great and engaging discussion. I love it. Great. So moving on to one of our next common uh, issues, well, form fields. So form fields, as I mentioned before, they're notorious for being inaccessible. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm not going to go through all of all of them, but I picked out three in particular today. One is them not being correctly tagged with area labels. Area labels is so that you know what the different form fields are and are able to fill it out correctly. Second, required fields only being marked with an inaccessible color. This is another big headache for my fiance and I because he will try to fill out a form, he will do it um, to the best of his ability, but he will not be able to see the red color that is indicating that he has misentered his email, for example, in the email form. So he's missing, in this example, it's John at email. So it's clearly missing the .com. But if you're colorblind, you would probably see the example on the right-hand side of the screen, which just shows uh, all the same colors marked around the different form fields versus on the left-hand side, you have the first name, last name, and password field marked in green, whereas the email is marked in red. And lastly, of course, we have uh, CAPTCHA as a spam security measure. Um, it is not always accessible. I know a great example of that for is um, CAPTCHA uh, sometimes is working on a certain time constraint. Not everyone is working as equally quickly on a website or filling out CAPTCHAs quickly. So when there is a one minute time constraint, someone may not be able to complete that in time, unfortunately. So there are, other ways around it. And so what should you do instead? Well, first of all, area labels. Again, this is where I said, this is one of the things you gotta work with your developer um, to make sure that they're also educated on accessibility. The next one we have is use symbols as well as color to mark form fields. So here in this updated example, you can see that when uh, the person has entered just John at email, it is not only color depicting which one is the incorrect form field, but there is also an X symbol showing that this is where there is something wrong, as well as some text saying, please enter a valid email. And again, this is not just something that benefits, um, benefits from an accessibility perspective. This is just creating a good user experience. And then of course, using other security measures than CAPTCHA, um, there are a myriad if you just Google uh, accessibility friendly security measures on forms, but there are logic or math tests that you can do. You can also do phone verification. So there's a couple of different options that you can definitely look into as well. Great. All right, the next common example I have is meaningful hyperlink text. And this is something for you communicators out there that is also important, not only in email marketing, but in emails that you send. So. Typically, and I have a good example and a bad, bad example here. So to get started, we'd love for you to install the Mincito browser extension, where the install the Mincito browser extension is hyperlinked. In the bad example, it says, to get started, we'd love for you to install the Mincito browser extension. Click here. The only problem is, if you have another link in the same email, it will say, click here. And then if you skip to the next one, next link, and you're using a screen reader, it'll just say, click here again and you'll have no context. What are the two different links and why are they both have click here? What does that mean? So a really good example is 
one, hyperlinking the text, but also making sure that there is a descriptive link text that makes sense so that instead, if you are using a screen reader, it would say the first link is install the Mencito browser extension. You know exactly where this link is taking you. Skip to the next link. Book a training session. You know exactly where this link is taking you and you don't have this mystery of read more, learn more, click here. And I have another example here as well from our website. And this is the, uh, the link text for one of our buttons for our quality assurance module. Instead of the link text just being learn more, it should be learn more about the quality assurance module. You need to make sure, again, giving context of where you're leading someone if um, they're using a form of assistive technology. Great, and I think this is the last kind of common example that I wanted to pick out, but it's also an incredibly important one, and it is captions for videos, webinars, and virtual events. I think it is something that is becoming more and more common. I've seen even social media platforms um, like Facebook and um, Instagram adding uh, captioning uh, more naturally as part of their uh, video, but captions can really make all the difference. And there's a couple of different things to remember. One is pre-recorded video, making sure that you are adding captions before you publish it, but also live captioning for events like today or interpreters, but also making sure that you have post-production and there are automated captioning services, but I think it's really important to still verify the quality or alternatively provide a transcript. And I think beyond us kind of getting conditioned and getting used to looking at um, subtitles, there's a lot of different benefits. It's also something that's incredibly helpful for someone with English as a second language. If they're not used to the person's um, accent or they're unfamiliar with a word, captions can make it much easier for them to be like, oh, I didn't know that word. I'm going, I can see how it's spelled in the captions and I can Google it and get, gain a better understanding. So those are some of the other things that I want to highlight that I think is becoming more and more common, right? And all right, with that said, I did just want to do a quick pulse check again and see if you guys have any other common accessibility issues that you've come across in your accessibility journey so far. And we'd love for you guys to share it in the chat. While I take a sip of water really quickly. Someone recently started to use Adobe Premiere Pro to add captions and then edit them. That's a great. Someone's asking about the color contrast checker. I will see if I have time at the end. Audio descriptions. I think that's a really great um, example as well. Um, if you, for example, are posting a video, it's also great to post a little description of what is in the video. I've started to see that pop up more and more common, commonly. Um, links that only rely on color, no underlining. Oh, that is a really great example as well. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, definitely. So you know when it's been clicked on or not. Again, this all has to come down to color contrast. So great. All right, let us continue on then. We've got lots of great stuff to cover. So the WCAG standards and how to comply with them. You've heard me mention it a couple of times, but let's jump into what it is. So you'll hear people refer to this as WCAG or VCAG sometimes, or as I say, WCAG. And what that stands for is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And these are um, internationally recognized standards that have been put forth by the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. And they are put together by volunteers all around the world who put together standards of saying this is uh, the current or this is an acceptable level of accessibility. So the first version 2.0, uh, I believe was published back in I want to say in the early 2000s. Uh, and then later on, we had version 2.1, which is the latest version as of now, uh, which was published, I believe, in 2008. And they are set up in three different levels. So you have different versions, and those are different releases. And then each of these releases, you have three different levels. A, which is the lowest, which is the kind of minimal acceptance of accessibility in each of these versions, double A, which is kind of the, the acceptable use, and then triple A, which is kind of the gold standard. 
so we'll talk a little bit more about accessibility legislation right now, but most accessibility legislation will reference one of these WCAG standards to indicate what level you should be complying with. Some other developments that are happening that I think are important to note, and you'll probably hear a little bit about as you research accessibility is the draft version or WCAG draft version 2.2. We have been waiting for this eagerly for the past couple of years, and it was originally intended, intended to be released last year, um, then later, initially this spring. I, the latest reports are saying that it will potentially be released in September of 2022, so 20, of this year. Um, and the reason it takes so long is, of course, again, this is an international and global project uh, to recognize new standards. The draft version 2.2, we have already been able to see some uh, examples and draft versions of it. So we've actually set up so that you're able to scan for that already. So if that's something you're curious to do to get ahead um, and you're already using our platform, you can definitely check that out. Uh, but the draft version 2.2 will also use the A, AA or AAA levels. The other thing as you research um, website accessibility that you'll read about is draft version 3.0. And that is something that is probably going to come uh, in a couple of years. So it is yet another level where, which will take even more progressive steps to um, looking at uh, digital accessibility and not only on uh, websites and smartphones and application or digital applications, but probably also going beyond. And they will most likely also continue to evolve the kind of uh, standards with uh, introducing new different levels of bronze, silver, and gold. But that is something that we will continue to keep you updated on um, as the time goes on. But it is definitely something that you will hear a lot about in the accessibility space, but they're not published versions yet. I think that's the important thing to note. So when you are trying to comply with something, you're most likely going to try to comply with version 2.0 or 2.1 because those are the published versions right now. I would absolutely absolutely recommend try to comply with the latest version. So in this case, or latest published version. So in this case, 2.1. And when 2.2 comes out, try to comply with that. It's always great to be as accessible as possible uh, where you can be. All right, so one of the things I also wanted to talk about when it comes to website accessibility is the poor principles and the poor principles are perceivable that, or that your website needs to be perceivable, understandable, operable, and robust. So perceivable, for example, we're used to being able to see an image. Alt text makes it uh, that image perceivable to someone with visual impairments. Understandable, uh, oh no, I'm taking them in the wrong order. Operable, we'll take that first. Like I mentioned before, we're used to using a mouse and keyboard, but in theory, you should be able to operate the website uh, in the exact same way with a screen reader understandable. This is all about consistency, the user experience, making sure it is user friendly. For example, I'm always used to there being a privacy policy in the footer. Don't confuse me with um, other layouts that are not as common and robust. Again, not everyone uses a desktop to access your website. Make sure it's also accessible on mobile devices such as smartphones and tablets. So again, a lot of these you'll see are connected to just an overall good user experience. So now that we know a little bit more about the WCAG standards, how do you comply with them? There's a couple of different questions that you need to ask yourself, and we're gonna jump into that. But the first one is what legislation and laws is my organization subject to? You need to find out what you're subject to, and then you can figure out what WCAG standards you at minimum need to comply with. If you can go above and beyond and comply with the latest version, I would definitely say you should. Then, yeah, what WCEG standard does it refer to? And then last but not least, figuring out where you currently stack up. If you want to um, achieve WCAG uh, 2.1 AA compliance, what do you need to do to get there? Because you're most likely not already there. It is uh, a long journey. All right, so looking at web accessibility le legislation, I think in North America, there is what well, we're going to look at the US and take a quick look at that. And then also, um, Canada, and I can see I have a little error here, so I'm going to apologize for that. 
in advance and explain. So on the US side of things, there are two main accessibility legislations uh, on a national level. The first one is section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act from 1973, and that applies to federal agencies making sure that their um, IT and their systems are accessible. The second one that affects private organizations is the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title III, where it states that all public accommodations need to be accessible. And we're gonna get into this because this uh, wording of public accommodations is something that is much debated. So we'll jump into that in just a second. And then on the Canadian side, I actually meant to have not section 508, but the Accessible Canada Act, which again applies to federal agencies. And then in Canada, there are different provinces who have adopted at different states, the most notable one being the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, AODA, um, which mandates that organizations with more than 50 plus employees, and I think it might also be a, reven a revenue number, uh, need to make sure that their websites are accessible. But I was looking at it recently, and there are several different provinces that are following suit and trying to make uh, websites accessible within the next couple of years. So looking at accessibility legislation in North America, uh, but probably more specifically at the United States, this spring, the US Department of Justice did present a new guidance of, on web accessibility. And I think this is incredibly important because I think one of the big misinterpretations is that the Department of Justice is not the one passing the laws, they can just release interpretations. And they have released a very important interpretation on the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, Title III, on that is a website, a public accommodation. And there is a big circuit court split in the United States, if you're familiar with the legal system. Um, it is kind of moving up through the courts and it is expected that at some point the Supreme Court will need to do a ruling as to whether or not digital assets such as websites are a public accommodation. But the recent Department of Justice guidance did state that an, an inaccessible website can exclude people just as much as steps at an entrance to a physical location. And in recent years, a multitude of services have moved online and people rely on websites like never before for all aspects of daily living. So I think that's incredibly important to highlight um, that accessibility is kind of, it's not going anywhere, especially in the online and digital world is probably something that will continue to grow in importance. Beyond that, and this slide is not meant to scare you, it is just to get, provide you with information. There continues to be a myriad of accessibility lawsuits specifically related to websites, um, about four, four and a half thousand expected in 2022, just over 4,000 in 2021. Um, about 10 law firms account for the majority of these filed cases and they're going after primarily e-commerce. Um, so again, um, cases where you are very much exposed to kind of a, a B2C or um, consumer or public um, organization. So what do you need to know about what if you get a demand letter or lawsuit? And again, as we said at the beginning of the webinar, the most important thing is you consult your own legal counsel. Uh, but if you've checked out any of our um, webinars earlier on uh, the legal aspects, it is, of course, you need to accept that your website probably isn't perfect. So fix not only what's stated, but work on a plan for compliance going forward. It is not a set it and forget it type of thing when you're tackling website accessibility. You need to work on it on an ongoing uh, basis uh, and work towards a compliance plan. Make sure it's something that's being touched every month, every week, or maybe sometimes every day to get it to where it needs to be. Um, it can also impact um, the reputation of your organization. Um, and then of course, there's the cost of litigation versus settlement. There's also in certain states penalties to pay to plaintiffs. Uh, but again, this all really depends on your organization. And these were just a few of the things we wanted to highlight is the important thing is do it for the right reasons. Make sure you have a great accessibility compliance plan. So wrapping, trying to wrap it up because I know we've only got about 16 minutes left. What should you be prioritizing? Well, first of all, audit your website. Does it currently have accessibility issues? What legislation do you need to comply with? What WCAG standard? Where are you already compliant? What needs improvement and what's failing, right? It's all about prioritization or knowing where you're at so that you can prioritize. And that's kind of my next point is make sure 
that you are prioritizing your content because website accessibility can seem like an absolutely overwhelming task. So you need to start somewhere just like anything. And that's where prioritization comes in. So tackle your most popular content first, where you know uh, people are going to visit when they are coming into your organization. They will definitely visit your homepage. Make sure that's flawless. Uh, take a look at what's your most visited pages. What are your most downloaded documents? Something we've not touched upon is if you have documents on your websites, for example, in PDF, that is considered website content. So you need to make sure that that is also accessible. But go after, uh, tackle the most popular things and then go after the low hanging fruit. Make sure you're going at it uh, over time. So if you have block off an hour every Friday just to update all texts on your blog and then work with a developer on more of an ongoing basis to tackle some of these more complex compliance tasks like forms. Another great thing to do that you should be doing when regards to your website is, and your organization is identify an accessibility champion. Make sure you have an internal resource who's dedicated to the initiative. It is something that's so easy to say, you know what, we'll look at it later, but that's not necessarily the best way to tackle it. So make sure you have a champion and internally who can not only stay up to date with legislation uh, that specifically maybe affects your industry, but maybe also where you're located, your region, if there's regional things, identify when and where there's changes, make sure it's a priority um, to train people internally and continuously do it as, as you onboard new people. I think refreshers like this are incredibly important uh, and also increases accountability across your organization. And then also looking at kind of key performance metrics over time, because that's something that you'll also be able to take to, for example, your management or your directors and highlight, hey, look how much progress we made on accessibility on our website. And then of course, setting up a feedback loop. So if you don't already have an accessibility statement on your website, we highly encourage you to have that. An accessibility statement is just kind of like a privacy policy where you can highlight uh, what you're doing in terms of accessibility. Um, I think one of the things we always encourage is transparency. So show your compliance history. Um, we always encourage customers to kind of publish their, their reports and just show that you're ma continuously making progress, right? And then make sure you have a, a channel for feedback. So if someone does spot an accessibility error on your website, how can they easily report it in so that you can quickly and swiftly take action on it? So that's really what an accessibility statement is for. Um, last but not least, one of the things that really hit me when I was learning about accessibility and is that accessibility isn't more work. You were just cutting corners before the work was incomplete. And this is just about thinking that, hey, you know what? Accessibility is not something that you're doing on top of the work you're already doing. Accessibility should be part of something, uh, part of the work that you're doing. So if you have a 10 step checklist uh, before something is complete, that checklist just got longer. It is, there's now an 11th thing on that checklist and it is accessibility and you are not complete until your piece of work is also accessible. Awesome, well, I think, Oh yeah, we just had a little quote here about from one of our, our um, clients as well who'd worked with our tool and gone from 60 to 90% compliance with using it. I'm not gonna jump into that. I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley now. So thank you so much. Fantastic, thanks so much, Jasmine. You've just shared so much wonderful information. I know myself, I was even taking a few notes. Um, but just um, for our kind of last thing that we'd like to offer you here, we would love to help you guys get started on your accessibility journey or help you wherever you're at. Um, so we'd like to offer you a free accessibility scan of your website. What this scan will do is it'll show you areas of your website where you could um, essentially, you know, fix some accessibility errors as well as some content errors such as broken links, misspelling. So with that, just wondering if you guys are interested in taking advantage of it. We have offers here for, you know, if you're interested, please feel free to get a free accessibility scan on my website. So select that option and we'll have someone reach out to you with those results. Interested in seeing a de demo of Monsito's, Monsito's accessibility module, please feel free to select that one. We'd be happy to, you know, show you how our platform works in action. Interested in finding out if my website has accessibility errors, um, that's great. With that free accessibility scan, we will be able to take a look at that and get those results in front of you pretty quickly. So 
I see we have um, a good amount of people who are continuing to vote. Um, I appreciate those answers who are ticking in. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we certainly love to help you um, on your accessibility journey, whether you're you know, in the middle of it or if you're just getting started or um, if you feel pretty confident about it, taking a look at our scan um, sometimes really gives people a good way to see maybe if there's something that slipped through the cracks that we're finding um, that maybe their team has it. Perfect. And Ashley, I'll leave this up so people can continue to vote in and I'll let you kind of jump to some of our other resources as well that could be helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much. So um, some resources to help you guys get started from us to you is our Moncito Accessibility Handbook. Um, we've had a lot of people, you know, get this handbook and say that it's been a great thing to take back to their teammates and get started or someone who maybe didn't understand accessibility. Great resource to dive into. We also have a Moncito Accessibility Checklist, which are really catered to your role. So we have Moncito Accessibility Checklist for content creators, as well as one specific to managers and designers and developers, um, because you're, you know, based on your role, there may be certain things that you're in charge of versus someone else in, in the accessibility aspect. So really encourage you guys to take a look at those, as well as the Accessibility Statement Generator. Um, every website is required to have an accessibility statement on their website. Therefore, we offer a resource here at Moncito where we can, you can go in, on our website, put in your information, and we will generate one for you. And we also offer a color, color contrast checker, as Jasmine was um, discussing, and even, you know, how she was talking about her fiance as well, is color co contrast is such a huge thing, and it's something that we often don't realize. So feel free to check out our color contrast checker um, just to see if maybe some of the images or some of um, the colors that you're playing with on your website, if they are accessible or not. And just a quick note that all of these resources will be shared with you in some of the post follow up from um, our session. So um, if you're if you want to hang tight, you'll get those in your inbox, but feel free to also go to momsudo.com where you can find these. Awesome. I'll just end the poll here and then I'll quickly just chat or speak to one more resource before we jump into the Q&A. And then it's that we have some new how-to videos on our YouTube channel as well that look at some common accessibility issues and show you how they can be addressed using our platform. And with that, I think we'll jump into the Q&A. So I'll let you, I can see there's a lot of great ones already, but Ashley, I'll let you jump into it. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get to our first question um, here. And it is, does, um, when it comes to alt text, um, should the context piece, sorry, let me, let me read this. Should color be stated? Um, she said the context piece makes total sense, but is it helpful to state colors? For example, um, like when we were talking about the golden retriever, would it have made sense to say the tan, he was sitting on a tan carpet? I think it's one of those things, uh, it's that balance of being uh, descriptive and informative right so depending on the context of other things for example if I'm adopting a puppy and I am using a screen reader I would maybe like to know that the puppy is a golden golden retriever I don't know if they come in other colors anyone else can correct me out there uh, but for something like the carpet would not be uh, as important but there are lots of different variations and I know alt text can also be one of those things I mean you guys just saw the variations in the chat that we got right so it is really using your best judgment and I know uh, our team member Michael dropped a great kind of alt text tree in there that helps kind of determine whether or not it's something that can be included. So I would definitely recommend using that as a resource. And it's something we can add in the slide deck afterwards as well before we share it. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Jasmine. And then I have another um, question here that I pulled from the chat and it says um, in alt, just I'm gonna keep with the theme of alt text here. In okay. alt text, need to specify male or female. I know with gender inclusion um, nowadays, we want to uh, be sensitive to that. So that was that's, that's another great question, right? So it depends probably on your organization's preferences as well. You can, of course, always say a person if you would prefer to be uh, gender neutral as well. So that is something that you guys can both define for your organization. Um, I think consistency and, and also looking at the context, is it important to the context? Then 
yes, you can add it, but probably in a lot of cases, it is not um, important to the context. So it is really a, a determination for your um, organization. Awesome, thanks, Jocelyn, that was a fantastic answer. And then I'm gonna go ahead and roll on into the next question here. If a website is not mobile optimized, mm -hmm. is it considered inaccessible? Because most government sites are not mobile friendly. That's a great question. So is it, is it not, uh, is it considered inaccessible? To some degree, yes, actually it is. We just launched a couple of new um, accessibility checks looking specifically at mobile accessibility. And if a website is not optimized for mobile, one of there's two checks for that. One of them is the inability to do pinch to zoom. What, so if you're looking at me on the, ca on the camera right now, you can see me pinching and zooming to zoom in on a phone. That is something that would be incredibly frustrating and inaccessible for someone who has low vision because that pinch to zoom enables screen magnification so that you can perhaps access the information you need. Um, another aspect of mobile, or the other aspect of mobile accessibility, if it's not mobile friendly, is that the websites are then typically full width, which means that to be uh, able to read, you will not only need to scroll down, but you need to scroll side to side. And that is something that not, can not only be very difficult for someone who has uh, mobility issues, but uh, think about all of us today who are working on laptops who have a carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, in our wrists. It is not accessible um, if you are not ensuring that your website is mobile optimized. And I think another important way to make that case in your organization is look at the data. I've heard this from um, some other uh, government organizations that we worked before is that it's not something that's prioritized in your organization because people think that they're doing everything from a desktop computer. We all know that's not the reality today. We're all glued to our mobile phones all the time. We're using iPads while we're on the go. So look at the data for your uh, website. How much mobile traffic do you have? That is what will help you uh, put forward the case for not only making sure that your de the desktop version of your website is accessible, but also the mobile version. And it is only, like I said, two checks that really ensure mobile accessibility, but they are incredibly important and can make a big difference as to whether someone is able to complete a task online or actually needs to physically come to your location. Awesome, yeah, great point there. Um, Jocelyn, I appreciate you saying that. I know myself, um, I'm glued to my phone. I, I'm a mobile user um, and I've had an experience where maybe I was about to buy an item or something online, but when I went to go to the checkout, it was, you know, an ill fitting to my mobile phone and I didn't end up going with that vendor. So very good point there. And I know for sake of time, um, we're kind of wrapping things up here. I do want to mention that if we didn't get to your question today, um, we'll do our best to answer it um, within our follow-up emails. But I thought that this was um, a really good one that I wanted to point out. Someone was asking, you know, do you think there will be an alt text generator that could help guide us? Um, my answer to that is also, please feel free to reach out to us here at Moncito because our web accessibility scan will also catch um, areas where maybe alt text is missing or it can be added. And uh, one of our specialists would be happy to do that with you. So if you're the person who asked that question, please feel free to um, request a demo or an accessibility scan. Yeah, no, and and then, I think, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I'll just add on to it really quickly before we wrap up. Alt text generators, there are, there are options out there that are that do use artificial intelligence to generate alt text. I think the danger with this as with all accessibility is anytime you're using a solution that uses um, artificial intelligence is you also need human verification. It may 90% of the time accurately give you an alt text description, um, but there's also a lot of cases where it doesn't or the context is not correctly, just like the image of the puppy that I showed you. Um, an alt text generator would not be able to include things such as context or function on the page of the website. So yes, it might be a great starting point, I would say, but alt text, uh, like so many other things in accessibility, absolutely need human verification to really do it um, justice. Awesome. Thank you so much for your input. And um, we do have just about one minute left here. I do see that we have, um, you know, two or three questions that we didn't get to, um, but please feel free to, um, 
you know, as I mentioned, reach out to myself or Jasmine or um, request one of those demos or an accessibility scan because we'll be happy to answer any of your questions there as well. Exactly. Um, and I'd be happy to reach out to anyone whose question I didn't get to answer uh, within the next couple of days to give you guys an answer as well. So don't worry about that. Exactly. And then as um, just a quick reminder here, we will be sending the recording and the slides following this session. Thank you guys all so much for showing up today and attending the webinar. We hope that you um, felt so confident, you know, to tackle accessibility in your organization, maybe become a champion yourself. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining. We hope to see you at the next webinar. And Jasmine, I'm not sure if you have any closing comments on your end. No, I just want to say thank you, everyone. And I hope you thought it was, I wasn't able to look at the chat so much, but it looks like there's lots of great activity. So thank you, everyone.